Thanks everyone for joining. We're going to go through. Uh, we're going to go through about how to do a full study on this one. Because um, we're starting off the, the sort of the year of teaching, I thought it might be okay to try and do a session just on how to do a full study. Because um, I know a few of you are starting off on your logbooks, and the logbooks uh, for the DDU, knowing how to do a full study is obviously extremely important. So what I might do is I'll take you through how I do a full study. It's um, it's taught to me by sonographers. I think most people tend to follow this sort of pattern of doing studies. Um, it wouldn't be universal. I'll try and give you a few of the tips and tricks that I do along the way. And, uh, you know, please chime in if you've got any other tips and tricks to tell the rest of the group. Otherwise, I'll just keep chatting and uh, I'm going to start talking if I say too much. OK, so um, I've got the Echo Pro. Uh, this is Bob who's going to help us out do this. So we start off with our parastone long axis views. Um, I am going to get rid of a few things on the body to make things a bit easier for us to see. It is a bit hard to do this in real life, obviously. Fantastic. So, parasternal long axis view, first of all. We're looking to try and find the, you know, the second, third intercostal space. You can start up in the second intercostal space. Um, Next door to the, you know, right next door to the Ziffy Stone, you can start to try and sit in this intercostal space and try and fan down if you're doing that. So you know, fan down if you're looking into the, uh, if you're in the second intercostal space. If you come down a rib space, make sure you look up. If you come down a further rib space, you've got to look up a little bit more. And sometimes with those COPD patients, you're coming right the way down, to sort of the almost like the seventh, eighth intercostal space. And you'll see as I come down further and further, this axis of the left ventricle points further and further upwards uh, to the top of this, the, uh, the sector width. It honestly doesn't matter. Sometimes you're getting, uh, you know, parasternal long axis, is, axis views in the subcostal position in some of our patients. I, I think that's okay as long as you're understanding the limitations of what you're looking at. So what we're trying to figure out here would be mainly LV size, getting an idea of LV function, mitral valve and aortic valve function, left atrial size, uh, you know, maybe having a look at this aortic root and the right ventricle. And this last bit can be a bit tricky when you're sitting there in the subcostal region. So, you know, ideally we want to be up here in about the, like the third intercostal space. I find my aortic valve and use that as my fulcrum for the parasternal view. And what I mean by that is I try and put that into the middle of the middle of the screen. And I'm then going to try and do little bits of rotation, trying to make that left ventricle look wide. Just make this a little bit wider. OK, because I don't want to rotate around too far and cut off the, the LV, I want it to make it long and thin. Now we're looking at LV size and we're looking at LV function in this one. And as we said in that last week's tutorial, how important these are to try and get done correctly. And so what I want to do here is I want to measure with two dimensional, um, on the 2D image, I don't use M mode that much anymore. I'm going to measure at the tips of the mitral valve leaflet how big that left ventricle is. So that means I want to scale, I want to move down and I want to span up, trying to find the maximum area, I do little movements. I'm only moving this like five, 10 degrees, trying to keep that aortic valve open, try to have the ascending aorta like a big worm all the way up. And I'm trying to make this as big as possible. And if I think that might be somewhere like that, I can then pause. We can then move backwards and forwards. And I look for the largest area, so if I just come to there, I can see that that's where the mitral valve is filling the left ventricle, and then it's where they just close. And then I can measure across there perpendicular to the left ventricle axis, and I can measure it there. And I'm measuring that internal diameter, and the internal diameter, if it's bigger than 58 in blokes and 52 or 53 in women, that's the indication of starting to get up into that mildly dilated phase. Okay. You can then carry on strolling through, and just before the 
end systole. So that's when this is then at its narrowest state, just before the mitral valve opens. That's when you can measure it again, and you can start to get an idea of the end diastolic and end systolic cavity size. Okay. So that's how you're going to do LV size and function on your parasternal long axis view. Any questions so far? Everyone good? Let me do a color Doppler after this. You can put your color Doppler and you're going to put it over. You want to make it as small as possible. The bigger you make your color Doppler box, the reduction you get in your frame rates. And I'm sure uh, hey one who just uh, congratulations, he did his DDU physics exam today. So I'm sure hey one could tell us the physical principles why we get reduced frame rates when we have color Doppler on, but I won't ask him that. You're OK, but I'm sure he'll tell you. Congratulations again on getting the exam done. I know you did it with Umi, so Thank just uh, much, uh, much respect for you guys. Thanks, Fine. Um, uh, yeah, congratulations, mate. Good on you. I'm keeping fingers crossed. So, yeah, looking through that aortic valve, slide across, look at the mitral valve. You want your image optimized so that what you're looking for is sort of in the middle of the screen. So if we're looking for mitral regurge, I have my box filling, my box is as small as possible, but looking at that left atrium and looking at that mitral valve. Obviously, as we're doing these things, we need to watch our scale. So our scale is uh, where you see I've got it 20 centimeters a second at the moment. And what should happen if uh, Bob plays ball is as I turn this scale up, it should reduce that severity of what we're seeing about that color blood, blood flow. And the classic numbers I'm looking for is about 65. So 65 to 70 is what flows we should be sort of trying to avoid that aliasing. Uh, again, as Hayward will tell us all about one day. Um, uh, the uh, you know making sure we're not sort of over calling severities of color Doppler valvular regurgitations. And 65 or so, 70 is what we can look at for the tricuspid, aortic, and mitral valves. When I'm looking for low flow states, as I was just before I logged on, uh, that's where we're using you know, 20 or 25, sometimes 30 centimeters a second. So I'm particularly looking for that when I'm doing VEXA studies or uh, left atrial appendage flows or um, uh, across the aorta flows. All right. Okay. Increase depth. We're increasing depth so we can have a look to see if we've got pleural effusions or pericardial effusions. Again, um, Andrew, how do you tell the difference between a pleural effusion and a pericardial effusion on a parasternal long axis? Or well, the location of the fluid in relation nice. to the descending aorta. Fantastic. So descending aorta sitting in here, it's in front of it and generally doesn't go behind the left atrium. We've got behind the, the aorta. That's where you've got in front of it. That's going to be a pericardial effusion. If it's behind it, you can sort of get a suggestion in there. That's where you get a, a, a pleural effusion. Very nice. Right. So I guess the, the pearls and pitfalls with the parasternal long axis view, therefore, just to make sure that you are not you know, horrifically off axis. Make sure you're not measuring, like I can make this patient look like they're a bit hypovolemic if I tilt the probe down, you know, you've almost got a kissing ventricle sign. I can do that the other way, the kissing ventricle sign. Just make sure that you are uh, on the, you know, the true axis of that uh, left ventricle. And I do that by finding that aortic valve, putting it in the middle of the screen, and then just doing a little bit of rotation around it. So the aortic valve should look open and long and thin going up. Okay. You can zoom in. If you want to do things like LVOT dimensions, you should be zooming in on your aortic valve. And then you can pause that and go during mid systole and measure from where the insertion points of both of these, uh, you know, the right coronary and the non or the left coronary uh, in there. And try and measure it exactly at the base of those uh, leaflets. Um, because that's going to then correspond to where we're going to do it for our apical five chamber view looking for our LVOT VTR. Okay. Once we've looked at this, uh, once we've looked at our parasternal long axis view, I'm going to start fanning down. I fan down to get this view called the RV inflow view. 
And what you can see is as I fan down, I start to hit a rib. And you can see here on the, the green part of my probe here is hitting a rib. And that's what gives me this black shadow. And so if we want to, it was fine when I was looking at my parasternal long axis view. You know, it's fine when I was doing that view. But as soon as you start looking down, I hit that rib. So you've got a couple of things that you can do. Either we just move the whole probe up and try and have a look down. Or what I prefer to do, and Bob won't show this very well, is I, I call it snuggling, where you sort of almost push the probe down. You can see me just bringing my probe in a bit further. I push it down and I slide off the rib to come into the intercostal space. So I use like almost like the skin turga to roll off the rib and that maintains the contact with the skin and just gives us a bit of better contact and helps us look, you know, get over that rib if you like. So I've sort of pushed down and rolled off to try and have a look over that rib into the RV inflow view. Okay. So in the RV inflow view, we've got, I'm trying to get a better view on that. So again, if I get lost, I'm always going to go back to what I know, which is my parasternal long axis view, do little bits of rotation, and then fan down. There we go. And this is our RV inflow view. With our right ventricle, right atrium, IVC, SVC. Okay. IVC coming in here. Color Doppler box over here. Sometimes it's a terrible angle, sometimes it's okay. We're all looking for that tricuspid regurg, so coming from our right ventricle into our right atrium. And what I'll sometimes do is I'll just tilt my probe over a little bit so that I've got this on the right side of the screen. And sometimes that could help my, you know, it might help my angle a little bit. You see, I'm all, you know, still pretty average, but I try and use that to try and help my angle. So all of my Doppler, I try and use governed by, uh, you know, governed by the color Doppler. So that if we're, you know, looking for a regurgitant Doppler jet, we've got to try and make sure we're absolutely in line with it. And so use your color Doppler to find the jet and then go off axis if you have to, to try and, um, to try and find it. So that was our RV inflow view. If I then tilt back up, I get back to my parasternal view. And if I carry on looking back up, and Bob isn't magic at this, but forgive him, I think he's pretty amazing, but he's not great at this view. But you get the idea that as I look up past, as I look up, I start to see the main uh, pulmonary artery here with the right and the left branches. And what you can see, it's a little bit further down. I can maybe see if I can just ham it up a little bit for it. But if I come down here, you start to get this view, which is of the RVOT. You know, no, normally, uh, you know, as I said, Bob, Bob's not perfect at this view, but you get the idea. So it's just sort of tilting up instead of tilting down or fanning up instead of fanning down. You can see the pulmonary valve here and you can stick your pulse wave Doppler box. I can try and get that angle appropriate because, you know, this is the angle of the blood flow. I can try and put it over to the right side of the image and I'll put my uh, gate just before that valve and I'll try and get an RVOT profile. And that RVOT profile, normally it looks like this, a kind of triangular shape. The more triangular it gets, the worse your pulmonary vascular resistance. And we can measure that with our pulmonary acceleration time. You know, how quick this, uh, this uh, going from no flow to peak flow, the time it takes to do that, if it's less than 90 milliseconds, that can indicate uh, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. But I also love it, we're looking for that flying W. And that flying W sign is indicative of significant pulmonary hypertension. And when we go through about RV size, function, hemodynamics, it'll be really important to have a look at uh, that because we're trying to integrate our RV findings with this. Cool. Okay. That's the parasternal views. Okay. So you got your. LV size, parasternal long axis, you've got your RV inflow view, and then you've got your um, RVOT view uh, in the in assessment of the pulmonary valve and looking at regurgitation. So for regurgitation, we're just sticking color Doppler box over, I'm just bringing a color Doppler box over the pulmonary valve. All right, let's move around and look at our short axis. 
So for the short axis, we imagine that there is a bar right the way down through the echo probe. So where I put my mouse, I imagine that is then fixed. I've got my aortic valve in the middle of the screen. And then using my right hand, I'm going to rotate around, keeping everything else in exactly the same position. And if I've done it correctly, that means that the aortic valve should be in the middle of the screen when my little marker is pointing towards the left shoulder. You can see I've got a bit of a rib shadow coming in there, and that's coming because I've accidentally got my sort of inferior portion of my probe is over the rib. So what do I have to do? I'm just going to move it up a little bit, and then I get rid of my rib shadow, and I've got a much better looking view. Let's just go through our anatomy very quickly. I'm sure you know this all, but just in case, here is our aortic valve. I've got a non-coronary cusp that's right next door to my interatrial septum. I've got my left coronary cusp next door to my left atrium. I've got my right coronary cusp surrounded by the right ventricle here. I've got my main pulmonary trunk, which is coming off from my pulmonary valve. I've got my RVOT, my right ventricle here, my right ventricle free wall. Nice place to measure RV free wall thickness at end diastole, seeing as make sure it's ideally less than five millimeters. If it's greater than that, it can be thickened. I've got my tricuspid valve. I've got my right atrium. Yep. And using color Doppler, I can try, and sometimes this is a pretty good view for getting a good angle for tricuspid regurge. If you've got a central tricuspid regurge, gently you can see it looks quite nice, the angle there. I don't have any regurgitation, so no point looking at. I can take my color box and put it over the RVOT. I look at the pulmonary valve, look at regurgitation again. And again, if I want to try and optimize this angle as best I can, if I was looking at that RVOT trace, I want to put my pulse wave just before the pulmonary valve, but I'll, I'll tip it over. You know, if that's our bog standard view, if I want to improve this Doppler angle, I will just tilt my probe up a little bit. And so I can try and maximize that angle as best I can. It's still what, like 30 degrees out, which isn't magic, but it's better than nothing. You know, just try and optimize it as best you can and understand you might underestimate the flows. Okay, just with basic echo, we'll do the same kind of things. We, you know, we can maybe put our color Doppler box over our interatrial septum. I can fan down, have a look at my mitral valve level, the anterior mitral valve being taking up two thirds, posterior mitral valve taking up the other third. I can start to get an idea of the RV size, and you can imagine what that size is compared to the LV. And ideally, it should be about 60% the size. Into atrial, uh, interventricular septum, make sure that's not pushed over to the left in core pulmonale. And I can look at the base. I can look at the mid, where I've got my two papillary muscles. If I see a rib shadow coming on, I'm going to move away from the section that was doing it. So the moment I can see that section is the lower portion in there where the green line is. So I'm just going to move the whole probe up a tiny bit. And you see it kind of sharpens up the image. And then I can fan down to have a look at the apex. And when I lose the papillary muscles, that's the apex. And every time as I go along, I can fan from the base of the heart to the mid ventricle level to the apical level. And you can see I'm not moving my probe more than, you know, the back of the probe is not moving more than three centimeters for, from that to that. Maybe it's a bit longer. What's that? I don't know. That's the base. I'll leave my mouse there. That's the apex. Oh, there's seven or eight centimeters, maybe. But, you know, it's not a far. It's just trying to get the idea that, you know, little movements make a big difference in echo. Um, so that's about it for that one. Obviously, this is my go-to view for backing things up. You know, we talk about in 2D, uh, sorry, in POCUS, when we're just using 2D, making sure you've, you're backing up any abnormalities in one plane and another. I totally agree with that, especially regional wall motion abnormalities. We'll go through it. I find regional wall motion abnormalities can be difficult. Um, and always my... my uh, short axis views are my go-to views to try and make sure that I'm not missing them. Okay.
ethical views. I'll take my probe. I'm going to get that nubbin pointing down towards the patient's left side down here. I'm going to try and find where the apex beat is. Should be around about you know the lateral, you know, maybe the, just past the midclavicular line. And I'm pointing my probe towards the patient's right shoulder. Yeah. I'm not trying to image their spleen. I'm trying to look up towards their right shoulder. And that's all then take me down. If I increase up the depth here, give me my four chamber view. I'll try and reduce the beam width so that what I'm interested in fills the screen. As hey, I will tell you, that will then increase your frame rate. I'm looking to have that interventricle septum down the middle of the screen and pointing towards the top of the sector width. I'm trying to avoid seeing the papillary muscles. So I'm just doing little bits of fanning. I don't want to see the aortic valve. I'll fan back from there. Then I've got my right ventricle, 60% the size of my left ventricle. And I've got my right atrium and left atrium. Next bit's up to you what kind of order you want to go into. I tried to look at different parts of the heart independently. I can start with the left ventricle. For the left ventricle, I want to make sure I'm not foreshortening the image. What I mean by foreshortening the image is at the moment I'm imaging from the true apex. Yep, you can see I'm imaging right through the apex of the heart there. If I am a rib space or, or so too high, a couple of things you can see. So first of all, you can see I'm here, I'm not imaging from the true apex of the heart. And again, Bob's not perfect with this, but you can get the idea. One of the things I've got to do is I've got to increase my sector width. And that's because the heart looks more spherical, it looks more globular, it looks more like a, a soccer ball than it does when I was at the true apex. The right ventricle looks unusually big, uh, and Bob's not perfect for this, but you know, you can make someone look like they've got a big RV if you're a rib space too high. So if you see the heart looking spherical and the RV looking big, just and you're in the apical view, just make sure you think, am I a rib space too high? Because look at the depth that we're at at the moment. As I come down a rib space and look up, I then see that heart is a lot more looking like a rugby ball. The, the depth is much uh, greater down below, and that's because we've got much more of a sort of on-axis view. The final way to try and tell if you're on-axis or off-axis, and Bob isn't perfect to this, but you can sort of get the idea, is I sometimes put my thumb at the top of the picture. I think we talked a little bit about this last week. I put my thumb at the top of the picture. The apex should stay stationary. It's the base of the heart that moves towards the apex in a twisting motion. The apex twists and it does thicken, but it stays where it is. As you are further and further off axis, so the apex moves a little bit more. And if the apex is bouncing up and down like this, you've got to think I'm off axis. Sometimes you can't get pictures on axis and that's okay, but just remember that when you're assessing things like regional wall motion abnormalities or ejection fraction, you can overestimate the severity of regional wall motion abnormalities or thickening or LV size and volumes if you're not careful. So just make sure you keep that in mind. And for me, I, I like using that. That's my tip and trick. I like looking to see if that apex moves because it should be stationary. All right, so that's the left ventricle first of all. And we can zoom in and we can do our um, four and two chamber and measure our ejection fractions. I guess a nice view. I can look at my using my tissue Doppler. I can't do that with this one, but you can do my tissue Doppler at the septal and lateral annulus. I try to make sure that I'm imaging that. You see, I'm I just moved my probe around a little bit. See if I'm off axis and I try and do my tissue Doppler, I'm looking at therefore how, how much that is moving towards like the um uh, the anterolateral wall. Whereas where you want to be, I want to slide it round so that, that 
septum is pointing towards so that the septum is right in the middle so that when i'm doing things like a tissue doppler of your or mapsy or whatever it is from the septal um, annulus it's going towards the apex it's not you don't get translational error if that makes sense same for a lateral annulus bob doesn't do tissue doppler so forgive me after that i might tilt my probe around a little bit so that i'm then looking at the inflow for that left ventricle inflow of the left ventricle i might want to check that out with color for example and just try and have a look to see what's the direction of blood flow and if the direction of blood flow is in that direction you know that direction we want to just tilt around a little bit so that we make sure we're in, in line with the direction of flow try and have a look with a bit of pulse wave doppler at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets you can get your e and your a wave Nice change of scale, but I think you probably get my idea. Yeah, nice. I'll drop the baseline a bit. Oh, I killed it. Oh, don't do that. That shouldn't happen in a real uh, patient, obviously. That happens. That's a medical emergency. CPR um well that's loading up so we're at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets and we're going to look at the e and the a wave so the e wave happens during early diastole the a wave happens during the atrial kick when we're looking at the e and the a wave i want to measure the velocity of the e wave velocity of the a wave the d cell time of the e wave and we can use those for helping us look at diastolic dysfunction so what are the, hey Juan, can you give me, do you know what the four parts of the diastolic dysfunction assessment are? So I've given you the E and the A wave, and we've got our tissue okay. Doppler. Uh, what's the part of tissue Doppler that can help us with diastology? Um, e prime and Very nice. A prime. Yeah, mainly just the E prime, because then we can do okay. the <laughs> E over E prime is what we can often have a look at. Yeah. Uh, so cool, those are the two things. We've got the E and the A wave ratio, the E over E prime, nice. Uh, the absolute values of the E and the E prime as well. What's the next one? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. We've got the left atrial size. So when we're in that four chamber view, we can start having a look at the size of that left atrium. You can zoom in, or you can, I just tend to just do it as the left, as the, in the four chamber view. And we look at that four chamber left atrial volume, and then we can then trace that from annulus to annulus. You're ignoring the fuzz and ignoring the pulmonary veins and left atrial appendage if it's in there, and just trace around the uh, inside of that left atrium. And it'll give you an idea of a volume and things like that. And then the last one is looking at the tricuspid regurgitation jet. Uh, and if that's greater than 2.8 meters a second, and you do not have pulmonary hypertension, it gives you an idea of where you're at. Right, let's try that again. Right, so we are apical four chamber view. We've done our E and A waves. Done our E and our A waves, we've done our E prime, and then we can pause that. You want to make that aorta look as big as possible. So just before those as those close, so just before you get emptying, where it's emptying there. Just as it closes there, we can then measure around here what our left atrial volume is. We can actually do that, so let me have a look. What I'm, 
I think I've probably said this a few times, so you forgive me if I'm repeating myself. When you're tracing these things out, I do not look at the actual cross. I look about a centimeter or two ahead of it. And I let the cross then follow my eyes. I find if I look at the cross, I, I tend to get it all wibbly. If you're looking ahead of the cross, it's a bit like um, when you're driving a car and you're going around a corner, you don't look at the front of the bonnet, right? You look where you're going to be turning the corner into, uh, you know, same with surfing or whatever. You know, you look look ahead where you've got to go. And so same with this. So just follow ahead and your eye and your fingers will follow the where your eye is. All right. Okay. Four chamber. I'll finish off the four chamber before I go to the five chamber. So once I've got my nice four chamber, I'm going to then look at the right side of the heart. Okay. So if our standard four chamber is here, I'm going to do some things where you're going to keep it in exactly this position. Things like tapsy. If you're looking with M mode through there, you want to see how that lateral annulus moves towards the apex. Because again, the base of the heart moves towards the apex. You've got a predominance of the longitudinal fibers in your RV free wall. So TAPSI is a pretty good measure most of the time in trying to see what that motion is. Um, so I can do my TAPSI there, trying to have a look at the movement up and down. I'm trying to avoid the translational error there. So I just move my probe a little bit to get rid of all this gump. And then I can look at what the movement is from its bottom to its top. And that's the tricuspid annual plane systolic excursion. After that, we can use our Doppler with our pulse wave Doppler, and we can try and have a look at tissue Doppler. Uh, it doesn't work on this one, obviously. Try and have a look at the S wave in particular, so that can give you an idea of what systole is. Um, and if it's greater than 9.5, that's suggesting normal function. You can use the S prime for the septal and lateral annulus. I, I don't tend to do it so much because, you know, it's it's often not the best one. I'll often use sort of maybe subjective assessment, sometimes MAPSI, sorry, we didn't talk about MAPSI, as well as the tissue Doppler, you can do, like you have TAPSI on the right ventricle, you can have MAPSI on the LV, and if it's uh, of, the, of the lateral and the septal annulus, and that's normally meant to be greater than eight millimeters to suggest it's normal, correlates pretty well with systolic function. Again, we spoke about that last week. Uh, and then the last bit is to have, try and have a look for tricuspid regurgitation. So we're gonna have a start using the color. So if I'm now moving over into color Doppler, I'll start looking at my tricuspid valve. I might move my whole probe, tilt it around, so the RV is then in the middle of the view. So it's known as an RV-centric view. I can even slide that probe, follow that rib space round. So if that's our sort of bog-standard four-chamber view, say I want to look right down the gun barrel of that right ventricle, I'll move my whole probe across a bit, and then I'll tilt it over. Okay. And what's that's happening then is it gets, so I'm trying to look for that central regurgitation jet. If it's in that direction, a bit of off-axis imaging can help me bring my probe sort of down in line where it is. So don't be afraid to go off-axis, I guess what I'm trying to say, looking for regurgitation jet. That's really good for the right ventricle. Go back to the standard four chamber view. the LV color Doppler, you know, we've looked at the inflow view, you can then look at mitral regurge. And you can look at the mitral regurge, and I will fan through that structure, going up, up and down, trying to find that maximum jet, trying to see if it's eccentric. I'm also going to fan through it looking for this little structure here. Can anyone tell me what that is? Remember? Vein. Yeah, which one? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that, Sam. Uh, let's say left up. And that's what I'm going to show you here. So if I can find that one, you can see it at the back here. Yep. So if I'm looking directly up at the heart from here, the pulmonary vein that we're looking at is the right, 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 no, right, the right, right, right lower pulmonary vein. Yeah, so it's the right lower pulmonary vein. Sometimes you can find the left lower pulmonary vein, but it's you, uh, hopefully that might help you remember it so that I'm looking at the back of the heart. Remember, if we're going to have a look at the five chamber view in a second, we start moving up. You can see the angle that I'm then cutting the heart at. Yeah, and that's going to be the 
the right upper pulmonary vein. I, I very rarely see that, I've got to say. So most of the time we're looking at that right lower pulmonary vein, and then sometimes that left lower pulmonary vein. Uh, and you've ever heard me talk about left atrial pressure or mitral regurg. I, I love these pulmonary veins. This is, and I really like these ones. Like if you're looking for severe mitral regurg or significantly elevated left atrial pressure, I will put my pulse wave Doppler box at the back here. And you can put it so you're, I'll use, sorry, before I do that, to find out where your pulmonary veins are. You often can't see them as well as this, but I'll put my color box over there. I'll turn down my scale of, I'll turn down my scale to sort of 30 or so. And that really helps us see low flow states like for pulmonary veins. I'll then get my pulse wave Doppler. Even if I can't see where the hell I'm putting it, I just put it over the color about five millimeters or you know, two to five millimeters into the um, pulmonary vein. And that's when we can start having a look at flows. Bob won't show you these, unfortunately. And those flows in there, you can't fake if they're abnormal. So particularly if you've got systolic blunting or systolic flow reversal in severe MR, you know, you can't fake that. Sometimes you get crappy Doppler angles or you've messed up your color, you know, color box scale or something, you know, making mild look severe or something, but you can't fake, you can't make up systolic flow reversal. So it's really nice to have something that's a bit more certain sometimes. Um, that's it for the four chamber, really. And then, a couple of last things. Thank you, Michael, for reminding me. You can do RA area here. So normal areas for left atrium. We normally talk about volumes for left atrium. RA, you know, volume uh, areas are often done a bit more. So 16 centimeters squared for the RA. It's typically talk about less than 20 centimeters squared for the LA. But more importantly, volumes are really what they look at, and particularly volumes indexed to body surface area and greater than 32, I think, is abnormal. RV, you can look at fractional area change. I think if you zoom in on the RV, you can then freeze it. Look at this maximum diameter just before that opens. Come back down. That's the maximum area, and you can measure that area end diastole. You can then let it go as small as it goes and just before it opens up there, that's where you measure your end systolic area and you make a ratio out of that. The difference is a, is a percentage, excuse me, and anything greater than 35 is normal. So there's other ways that you can look at right ventricle uh, function and the right atrial size. Okay, a bit more Doppler. Let's talk about that next. So as we fan up, in comes the aortic valve. Blood flow, and Bob isn't perfect with this, but you can sort of get the idea. Blood flow, I find, comes out of the, let's get rid of that rib, excuse me. Blood flow tends to kind of, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, Blood flow, I find, tends to come out at a bit of an angle out of the LVOT. So to try and be in line with that angle, uh, I'll try and be in line with that angle, I sometimes move the, so I'm just going to find my full chamber view, make sure I'm not full shortening the image. There's my full chamber, angle up, I can see my aortic valve, get rid of that. I'm just, just pulling down, so I get rid of that rib. I'm going to move it over to that side. And by moving it over to that side, over to the left, I get a bit of much better angle to have a look down through here for something like pulse wave Doppler. And what I'm looking for, and again, Bob doesn't do this very well, forgive me, but when I start putting my pulse wave Doppler box through there, what you're meant to see is this closing click. And this closing click tells you that you're sitting right at the right where those two aortic valves are closing. And that little sort of jet of blood, or it's almost like a, you know, a bang as you shut the door. That's what that closing click shows. What I don't want to see is the opening of the door. You don't pull that uh, 
into too far into the aortic valve because then you'll see the door opening and not closing. So imagine like, for me, I imagine that door shutting, it should not hit you in the face. If you were to stand there and, you know, have the guts not to move, if that door closed, it would not hit you in the face, but you'd certainly feel maybe like a little thing of air. And that's what we should be seeing in that closing click. You don't want to be feeling that door opening and closing both ways. <laughs> you, sorry, trying to do this with an interpretive dance over the air is airways. But you know, you get my idea. So just the closing click, because then you are looking at your flows through your LVOT at the same place that you measured its size in the peristaltic lung access view. Pulse wave Doppler is the LVOT. Continuous wave Doppler is the aortic valve flows. And you can see the difference between the continuous wave Doppler, it's all filled in. Pulsed wave Doppler, and you're looking at, sorry, continuous wave Doppler is all filled in. And we're dealing here in meters per second. That's two meters a second when we go to pulse wave Doppler. Our scales are much smaller, otherwise you start to get aliasing that's happening here. If I was to change my scale. I'm not going to use pulse wave Doppler anymore, okay? So yeah, the pulse wave Doppler looks, so uh, you get that aliasing again, which Haywan will explain, I'll make him explain that sometime. Um, so aliasing occurs when you get over about just under two meters a second, maybe one and a half meters a second. And uh, you're just looking at a particular phase of the, um, you know, just in one particular spot. Whereas continuous wave Doppler looks at everything down that, uh, down that line. Okay, so we've done the four chamber, that's the five chamber. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate around for our two and three chamber. And then we're going to go and have a look at our subcostal view. And we've got about five or so minutes to do that. I'll just let this fire up. I hope this is useful, guys. Again, I apologize if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but I hope it's useful. So when you're doing a full study, there should be at least, you know, maybe 45 pictures. You're going to have to submit them for the DDU, a few case studies. They've got to be full studies. Um, you know, you're taking pictures of each of the things I talked about there. You're taking a picture as you go on each one. You're trying to tell a story. If you're seeing some pathology, go and investigate in a bit more detail, looking for regional wall, you know, making sure you're assessing it from all of the different angles. Um, and, you know, I think it's all, it's all important stuff. Right, where do we get to? Um, Sam, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. If, so if you're struggling to get the a good access for your LVOT view, what do you find is the alternative best yeah, yeah. I mean, option? I'll, I'll show you the three chambers, your only other alternative, right? Because you've got to be in alignment with the flow of blood. So the flow of blood, if I've got my LVOT, is coming from inside the LV, through the LVOT out of the aortic valve. And I think it comes to sort of that kind of angle, which is why I'll move it over to the left side of the screen so I'm in line with the blood flow. The only other option you've got after that is your three chamber view. So to get to that, I might take away the uh, skeleton thing, doesn't it? So to get to that view, so if I'm in that for my apical five chamber view, I'll go back to my four chamber so I get rid of the aortic valve by fanning down. I'll then twist it round so that I'm pointing more down that axis of the heart. But I won't go all the way. I'll try and keep that axis so that the LV is in the middle of the screen. Because whatever is in the middle of my screen in this view will stay in the middle of the screen in my other view. And that's how I'm going to go and try and move round to the two chamber. So then I'm going to use my keep everything else absolutely the same, and I go anti-clockwise. And I move around, and I should move around 60 degrees. As I move around 60 degrees, I've lost my right ventricle, and I've just got my anterior and inferior wall.
The anterior wall is the one on the right by the red line there. You can see it pointing up. And the green line, the one back, is the inferior wall. Okay? And then you've probably got something like P1, A2, P3. Okay? If I carry on going, keep rotating, keep rotating, keeping everything else the same, what comes on the right side of the image is my aortic valve. And so, you know, just trying to answer your question, Andrew, you know, it's not fantastically straightforward. Sometimes if you're buggered in one view, you're going to be buggered in the same, because I'm still in the same footprint, right? But sometimes it can help you. And this, I think when you're doing things like aortic stenosis, it's really important to try and look at every angle possible. But you don't have a lot of other great angles for looking at the LVOT BTI. You might, if you're looking for things like aortic stenosis, I generally grab a sonographer for this next bit because you can use a PDOF probe. And they can sometimes try and find ways, uh, for example, with supraclavicular views going down, looking towards the aortic valve. And they can have a look all the way down in there. Or if they're particularly brilliant, they can have a look at their right parasternal views to try and have a look down through that aortic valve, sometimes lower uh, lower um, uh, right parasternal views. I, I've got to be impressed. I was pretty impressed I found it so quickly whilst talking there. That's the fastest I've ever done it. These guys will do it. They, they can't even see anything. Obviously, it's a pedal probe. It's non-imaging probe. But they will, they will maybe find high aortic valve gradients without being able to see anything. So sonographers are generally the ones to ask to do that. So I hope that answers your question, Andrew. It's the, the short answer is it's very good. If you, can't, if you can't see it in your optical fiber chamber, you. you're generally bugged. Um, okay, that was David Gold for three. Let's do subcostal. Okay, so yeah. subcostal, um, you're all going to know this one. So I have the marker pointing towards the patient's left. I'm going to go underneath the ziffy sternum. I'm going to be a four or five centimeters away from that. I'm going to look up underneath the rib cage. I try and find something flapping around. I'll bring that into the middle of the screen. I increase up my depth and I start fanning up and down. And what I'm trying to find is my aortic valve. Once I found my aortic valve, I fan down until I lose it. And then I see my little nub in the left ventricle. Then I start rotating. And I rotate trying to make that look as big as long as possible. And that's my four chamber view. The next thing is I know you're all familiar with, I, I look for the IVC. The way I do this is I bring my right atrium into the middle of the screen. I rotate around it until I can see the IVC coming into that right atrium. And then you can measure your IVC there. Sometimes you can find some pulmonary veins which come off it just here. But more importantly for me is also then I look across to the patient's left side. And by looking from your IVC over to the right patient's side, you get another bite at your short axis. And here I can see the base of the heart, the mid ventricle level, and the apex. And this can be really useful in patients who are mechanically ventilated, looking for regional walls, whatever, you know, LV size and function. And it's just another way of trying to fan through that LV. Sometimes you can get a beautiful view to try and look at your uh, RVOT flows looking through just behind your pulmonary vein. And see, that's a great view for that. I don't know if it'll let me do it. I should just have a look. Yeah, nice. So I feel that. There you go. And there's a beautiful RVOT view. How good is... Um, oh. oh, yeah, oh, pulse wave. Don't do pulse wave. Sorry. Yes, no. <laughs> Can't stop me with the pulmonary hemodynamics. Stop that. Uh, the last little tip and trick is obviously looking at your suprasternal view. If you're looking for severe... Uh, you know, severe aortic regurgitation. What we're trying to do is find the uh, the aorta. Bob's not great at doing this as well. You can see that here's the aorta coming down. Little bits of rotation. Bob's a bit tricky on this, but you get the idea. Here goes the aorta. If we just do the front little, little bits of rotation we have here, where we can then start to try and angle down and try and have a look at our. Uh, flows for diastolic flow reversal, and we can do the same thing with the uh, descending aorta when you're in, instead of looking at the IVC, you just look over to patient's left, you can try to have a look at the aorta, and putting your pulse wave in there can try and help look for diastolic flow reversal. 
So that's kind of kind of it. It's you know should take about half an hour. Should be about forty five to sixty images. Full complete study looking at every valve, and I think every that's a minimum data set of what I've shown mostly there. And uh, and then we obviously got to go looking at all the valves and function, and we'll go through that over the course of the year. Um, again, I hope that was useful, guys. Uh, I know most of you have probably been through that a good few hundred times, but um, for those who have not, who might want to watch it later, I hope it was useful. Are there any questions anyone would like to ask, or any any other uh, pearls of wisdom you could share with the group? Yeah, it's just a question, um, but um, is, are the segments that you see on um, the apical um, long axis, yep. are they the same as um, parastonal long? Like you damn of... right they are. So watch this. Okay. So if I go to my apical, so if I want to find the apical three, I'm going to just do the exact same as what I described. I'm looking to go and get my septum pointed towards the top of the screen. I know this view, I'm then going to tilt round so this LV is in the middle of my view. I'm going to rotate my probe round 60 degrees, keeping over the same. And there's my two chamber view, inferior wall on the left of the image, uh, anterior wall on the right. I'll keep rotating round till I've got my three chamber view. And what yeah. you'll notice is that my marker is still pointing towards that right shoulder. So I'm in exact yeah. same plane. Let's see if I can demonstrate this. So if I do that, I'm in exactly the same plane as I would be if I don't move anything other than I'm slow. Oh, you can't do this in a human being. I'm taking away all the areas. But that looks exactly like the parasternal long axis. view, And all I'm doing is just sliding across it. So there's my three okay. chain. There's my parasternal long. So what are the walls, Hayward? Uh, So you can see, I think that's the infralateral wall. I think. And I have to figure this out because I always go from my two chamber where I've got my anterior and inferior, and then I've rotated round there. So that's going to be my anteroceptal and infralateral. Very nice. Some people can remember it just like that. I, I have to go for my two chamber every single time, even now. Thanks for that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, nice. Okay, so I'll try to do the same thing as nice one. I'll try and do So there's the apical four. Michael's asked if I can do that in the same way the subcostal. I just move my hand around and I just don't to move anything else. Maybe we'll have a look at with the. If I slide around there, it's sort of exactly the same, isn't it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Never done that before. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I better go and do some work. Um, I have those. Are there any other questions? If not, I just I, I can't remember who's here next week. I'm sorry. I'm in. I'm, I'm talking at some conference, so I'll find someone else to talk about uh, next week's plan, and I'll figure out what that is. I've written it down somewhere, but it will be on next week, uh, two to three. Thanks very much, guys. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Sam. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.